Hi, everybody. Wow. We just got finished with today's podcast with my second time interviewing Ben Azadi, the keto camper champion. And let me tell you, we started with Keto Flex. He's got a great announcement for everybody, but you got to stick with this till the end because when he talks about closing the gaps, you don't want to miss this. This was an incredible podcast. As always, the energy between Ben and I is just one of fluidity and flow and excitement and science, but he makes this very simple. He gives you the pillars of ketosis and understanding what it's all about. And then at the very end, he really does talk about closing the gaps in the journey. So join us for today's Beats with Ben Azadi, our special guest from Keto Campers. Hello and welcome back to the Beats with Kelly Kennedy. I'm so excited to have one of my very infrequent but ex very special return guests, Ben Azadi, our keto camper captain. And, uh, you know, Ben and I have had some great conversations. We've been able to share on each other's podcasts, but I really asked Ben to come back today to talk about two things. One is I've, this man is everywhere. He's doing everything. He puts out so much content. If you are not following him or subscribing to everything he does, you need to, I cannot keep up with him, but I did hear through one of his other podcasts that we have a new gift coming from Ben, which is his brain in a little bit of book. Can you tell us a little bit about what's coming soon? Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. I'm, I'm grateful to be back round two with you. We had so much fun in round one. Uh, I just love what you're doing and uh, it's, we always have a good time. Our, our energy exchange is so good. Uh, yeah, so I have a new book coming out and this is actually going to be one of the first, the first podcast that we, we could discuss it. It's called Keto Flex and it goes into my four pillars on how to really apply these ancient healing strategies, ketosis and intermittent fasting. So I have this four pillar structure that I've been teaching, teaching to the students in my Keto Camp Academy and I wanted to make it accessible to the world so it's about 200 pages, uh, 13 chap 14 chapters. And in the book, I really believe this is going to be the most uh, comprehensive book on keto ever written, where you're going to be able to actually read it and understand how the body works at a cellular level. So you could apply keto and do it the right way, where you're not making a lot of the mistakes so many people do with keto, because it's a very amazing, powerful tool. Ketosis is an intermittent fasting but just like all tools, you know, you need to know how to use it. So my goal with the book is to put together this, this four pillar plan. It takes about 60 days to get through those pillars. So you could read the book, you know, faster than that, but the, the pillars are going to take you about 60 days. And in 60 days, you will have experienced not only a, a, a down regulation of inflammation, but you'll get more energy, less brain fog. You might be getting off of medication, which is one of your, your strengths in teaching that maybe weaning off or getting off of it completely working with your doctor. But in 60 days, you're going to have reclaimed your health, reset your fat burning hormones, reset your, your circadian rhythm, and just do all the things that we were designed to do. So I outlined that in the book and Dr. Daniel Pompa, who, you know, of course, uh, he wrote amazing forward for the book. So I'm just so grateful to get it out there into the world. Well, it's very exciting for all of us who know how brilliant your scientific brain is that has also the unique ability to make it very simple and understandable to the layperson. And that's why I encourage, I requested you come back because you made ketosis so understandable. And I think for so many of our listeners, you know, the word diet versus nutrition has become such an issue. We talked about it last time, but our goal is to get people to understand that there is no perfect diet for everybody, correct? But you've got to be flexible. You can't be rigid. And that within that, though, when you're setting it up, you've got to be very precise in how you're doing that to create the flexibility of the body because it's a science and, and there's a precise way to turn these mechanisms on in the body. And it's different for men versus women, correct? Yeah, I have an entire chapter all about how to do it for women, by the way. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And and so can you just dive in a little bit about what a, what ketosis is? I for those if they hadn't listened to the first podcast in a very short term, and then why what what this flexibility concept is versus what is more prevalent, if you will, in the media about ketosis 
or Atkins or Paleo because they all seem the same and they are so not the same. They could not be farther from difference. And I think, Ben, you're one of the few, if I know of anybody else other than Dr. Pompa, that really accentuates this and, and accelerates it out there to the world to get people to understand this. So give us yeah, a thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, keto is not a diet. As we talked about before, it's a metabolic process. And all of our ancestors did keto, which is surprising to a lot of people. They, they think, wait, my ancestors did ketosis? They were in ketosis? Yes, because their environment um, forced them into ketosis. And we have uh, all of our cells are hardwired to go through periods of time where we're going in and out of ketosis, which is the keto flex principle. So when somebody says it's a fad, it's a trend, uh, they're really mistaken because they haven't studied the history of humankind and our ancestors went in and out of it. So their environment determined that. So when we actually could look at the body from a cellular lens, the way that you teach it, Kelly, the way that I teach it, we see that the cells could burn either sugar or fat. And when you're stuck as a sugar burner, it's not a clean so source of fuel. It's a toxic fuel source. It's kind of like firewood burning in this room right here with all this smoke being produced. Well, your cells produce energy, create cellular smoke, and sugar creates more byproducts, more cellular smoke, which leads to now inflammation around the cells. And all of a sudden, hormones can't get in as efficiently. Nutrients can't get in. Oxygen can't get in as efficiently. So good stuff can't get in. And then you have a barrier blocking the bad stuff from exiting the cell. And then you have these cells that are now replicating, leading to dysfunction, dis-ease. So if we could teach the body and teach the cells to transition to a cleaner fuel source ketones, that is a much cleaner f source of fuel. Like uh, It's like a gas stove. It's much cleaner for the surrounding environment. So keto is great. I love it. It's a tool, but it's not the only tool in the shed. So the way that we teach it here is to have that flexibility. We have this metabolism that's designed to be efficient in this way. I think, I, I believe burning fat is, should be our primary fuel source, but not the only fuel source. So the keto flex principle is for the first 60 days, we're going to be strict. We're going to get into ketosis. We're going to do variations of ketosis. We're going to transition you in there. So you're not experiencing any side effects when you do it the wrong way. And then we start applying other strategies, by the way, like intermittent fasting and then different variations of intermittent fasting. And then I have my third pillar. So let me just break down the four pillars real quick. The first pillar is the adaptation pillar, adapt. So in 28 days, we're getting you keto adapter. We're getting you into ketosis. The second pillar is the fast pillar. We start pairing intermittent fasting. And if you do it that way, getting metabolically flexible first, then fasting, it's much more efficient because fasting is like a muscle you want to develop over time. A lot of people hear about fasting and the amazing benefits of fasting, and then they jump right in without doing the work. And they feel like crap and they say, oh, fasting didn't work for me. I was hangry. I was irritable. Well, that's because you wouldn't be a couch potato for 10 years and go run a marathon. You got to do some training. So number one is get keto adapted. That's the first pillar. Number two, then we start practicing fasting. And then number three, you might find this interesting, is my phase pillar. And actually we phase out for 30 days, all carbohydrates, and we do the carnivore diet. And what that has done That's for me, for you, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, because I've experimented with the last year. I did 40 days, I did lab work, and it was tremendous for me. So I see the benefits of it short term. So we do 30 days of carnivore or, you know, variation. There's four different levels of carnivore. And then you have unlocked this pillar to start flexing. And those are the four main pillars that I uh, outline in the book. Well, that is super exciting. And I, I know that for all of our listeners, and if this is new information for you, please understand that what he just went over is like a five-year degree in biology and human anatomy and physiology in a 200-page, 14-chapter book that's going to be easy to understand because Listen, I started eating this way 25 years ago now. I've been in this industry for 25 years. And when I first got into it, the first thing they told me was stop eating cow dairy. I'm not a cow. Then I was told, you know, oh, you got to eat a little more meat because I was a horrible, um, really sick vegetarian that didn't eat enough of anything other than carbs and cow dairy. So I started changing my diet. And five years from then, by the time I was at like early 30s, 
my diet looked tremendously different than it had. But if I think about my diet, my early thirties to my mid forties, where I'm at now, it's so incredibly much better and different than then. And I feel like every year it gets a little different, a little better. Cause I learn more and I become more flexibility, more flexible. Like I was that hangry person that, oh my gosh, it's two in the afternoon. I haven't eaten breakfast yet. Watch out because I'm going to kill somebody. Whereas today I literally knew I had to wait till 2.30 because I ate at 9.30 last night. I wanted to give myself that 16 hour window um, because I worked late, blah, blah, blah. And I just was like, okay, I had like five bites of food. I was like, yeah, I'm not really interested. I want to move on. I can't wait to do Ben's podcast. So, you know, it's like food for me has become less important in the last three to four years of my life as I've incorporated these principles I was, I had to eat three meals a day. I had to eat all the time. I had to have snacks. I felt like I was dying because if I left the house without my food and my snacks, like what, what was going to happen to me? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm it's not dying. a fun way to live, is it? It's not. And so now it's like, I forget sometimes that I have an eight-year-old and he needs to eat a little more frequently than me because he's growing still. Right. Like, oh, oh yeah. You need food when we leave because <laughs> be five hours before we have food again, I need to bring you some snacks, but I could go, I mean, my husband, we just did a, a quick podcast about it today. He goes sometimes three days without food. And I ask him what he eats and he goes, I eat air. <laughs> yeah. I would argue week, that he, he is eating. He's, he's eating his body fat and that's why we have it. That's right. So Tell me about your nutrition, because I know you got involved in this. I mean, everybody heard your story, and if not, I'm sure it'll be in the book, and everybody's going to get your book we're so excited about. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you had a weight problem, correct? I, ha- I had a weight symptom. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you for that. You had a weight <laughs> symptom. Yeah. And, so you, and so you tried different diets. You looked at that, and it just wasn't helping you. Well, yeah. So I, I had a weight symptom. The The real problem was, was determined later. So I first initially just change my diet to whatever I was learning in men's health magazine. So I ate a lower fat, higher carb approach. I exercise excessively and I lost the weight, but an important lesson was that I went from, yeah, 250 pounds down to 170. So I lost 80 pounds of body fat, but I was then one of those fit sick people. I had digestive issues. I had acne, I had brain fog. So I wasn't necessarily healthy. So then I was exploring, like you said, Kelly, other uh, nutritional plans. I did a, a vegan diet for a year and a half, and then that didn't work for me. And then in 2013 is where I actually transitioned from a vegan approach, 100% plant-based to a ketogenic approach with intermittent fasting. And ever since then, since 2013, I've been uh, changing the structure a little bit, incorporating different foods. And now uh, I've under- I have I have this metabolic flexibility and freedom where I can do some days where I'm high carb, where I'm out of ketosis completely, and then I go back into it very efficiently. I could do 40 days of carnivore. I could even do more of a a vegan approach short term, but that's what it's about. It's about achieving that flexibility. And whenever you do vary your diet and nutrition, that creates an adaptation in the body where good cells get stronger and bad cells don't adapt. And that's what it's really all about. So keto is great. I don't think long-term ketosis is great. It's a matter of flexing in and out of ketosis that the magic happens. Because variety, as we say all the time, is the spice to life. You you can be intolerant to anything. So what I love about that is I often, one of Ben's greatest things he does is he posts amazing pictures of food. He has (laughs) some incredible pictures of food that you and your girlfriend make, of restaurants. And your food is so, has such a strong variety, color, and look to it. I don't think I've ever seen, like, do you get bored with food? Cause I know a lot of people get involved in this industry and they get bored. I'm not a great chef. I love to eat. Don't really know how to cook very well with spices and all that. I'm not, that's why I use, like we were talking about earlier, uh, before the podcast started, we were just talking about, I've used a couple companies lately, like Sun yeah. Bath and Trifecta. And, and we're going to talk about that in a second, but how does your diet, it, your nutrition rather, in regard now versus five years ago versus seven years ago when this journey started for you? Well, the, the main thing is I, I make sure I'm not getting any of these bad oils in my nutrition. So whether I'm making it at home or going at restaurants, these rancid fats like canola, soybean, cottonseed, rice bran oil, there is a no exception. Yeah. What else? Palm oil. Palm oil. Yeah, exactly. They're very unstable fats. So I have, you know, there's no exceptions with that. I, I make sure unless I, they, they come into my nutrition somehow that I'm unaware of, but I'm really diligent with that. 
I'll make an exception for sugar. I'll make an exception for carbohydrates. I'll intentionally have carbohydrates. I'll have healthy carbs because the body could burn down sugar. It could burn down the glucose from the carbohydrates, but it cannot burn these bad fats. So I make sure I'm not having these bad fats. I'm having more of the stable fats, avocados, avocado oil, olive, olive oil, coconut oil, duck fat, lard, the grass fed butter. Those are more stable fats that the cells and the cell membranes actually could use as an energy source. So for me, I'm not a chef either. I don't like to cook just like you, Kelly. Uh, I am not a fan of it. I used to actually despise uh, spending time in the kitchen cooking. I used to always spend time in there thinking I could spend these 30 minutes to study or to do something, do a live stream, do a podcast. And I would just be like, it would just annoy me that I had to cook. And I, and I would think I'd just rather just pay somebody else to cook for me. However, <laughs> over the last six months, using these meals plans that you spoke about, um, I've actually made it a tradition. I actually enjoy it. Me and my girlfriend, we go into the kitchen, we're playing an audio book or music. And it's actually a great reset for my day to kind of uh, make a meal with Natasha and my girlfriend and have it together. So it's now more of an enjoyable experience because I have this meal plan company that I use, which gives me the ingredients, gives me the instruction. And we have a team, me and my girlfriend, where we cook it together and then we enjoy the meal together. And, and we just started doing this. I was saying to Ben, because we we kind of fell into a rut of like during COVID, we know restaurants, no nothing. And it's like, oh my gosh, I and I are not that creative of cooks. And like, what are we having for dinner tonight? Let me guess, broccoli, asparagus, carrots, and either chicken, steak. Like, what do we have? Like it's, ugh. and it, it's cooked the same way over and over again, pretty much. So during COVID, we were like, okay, let's get some other, you know, meal plans in here at the beginning of this year. So I looked at a bunch of the different companies out there and it was tough, you know, to find an organic company that delivers without all the oils. And I have an eight year old. So, you know, I got to look at his palate as well as my palate. And I didn't know which company. So I ordered a bunch of them. I got four of them in to see which one I like. And now I'm starting to stagger them because what I found when I had done this before, because I fall in and out of these different things. I had a chef come to my house for a while. And then I changed that chef because, you know, you're looking for new ways to incorporate new delicious nutrition. Yeah. That's exciting because there's only so many ways I personally can saute broccoli and make it taste <laughs> delicious with salt and a little ghee or something. Like there's only so many ways. It's awesome. It's my favorite. I love it. Right. But you know, every once in a while, I do love to eat. I like a little variety. Um, but these companies are great. But as you said, you got to be diligent at reading the labels. And like I went in and said, no soy, because you can't get organic soy in this country. So no soy, no pork. I don't, I don't want pork. And if you're good and diligent, you can go in there, you can select what meals you want. You can say, I don't, can't have this. And there's other companies where you just order pre-made, you know, food that you can freeze. And then, you know, there's a, we're not here to advertise any of these companies. We're here to educate you that there's a lot of resources out there besides just turning ketosis on. But if you're not a creative chef or cook, there's great resources now out there for you where you're making the food at home because I think there's a lot to that. Like I much prefer, we talked about two companies. I much prefer the one where they send me the food to prepare than the one where it's already prepared because it's fresh or tasty. Yeah. And you not you don't know a hundred percent what's exactly in there. They might say this is in there, but you're not seeing it for yourself. You're not making it yourself. Right. So if it's the raw ingredient, I feel a little more in control. Although I do have my issues with pre-cut food and now the nutrient is dying. Blah, blah, blah. But you know, you do yeah. the best you can. And it's not every meal. We do this for two meals a week at our house. And we're using four companies. So each company is just once a month delivering two extra meals to us so that we have a little more flexibility. And we're trying to introduce new foods to Silas that maybe we don't know. Like neither one of us likes pickles. Well, we realized this about a year ago, we're like, well, maybe Silas likes pickles, but he's never been exposed to a pickle because neither one of us likes pickles. So he tasted pickle and guess what? He likes pickles. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but this is important because I think a lot of people fall into ruts. And, and, and eat, do you think eating a smoothie is good every day? I just, I don't know the answer to your, I don't know what your answer is, but I'm curious. Um, not every day. It makes your di digestive system lazy. So uh, I think it's important to, yeah, you could have it as like once in a while, have a nice collagen rich smoothie. But if you're doing it all the time, you're not doing, you're not allowing your digestive system to do the work and it makes it lazy. What do you think? A hundred percent agree. My husband actually yelled at me the other day because I was so hungry I didn't want to take the time to make food. So I was like, I'm just going to throw it all in the blender rather than cook it because it's so much faster. He goes, 
oh, really? Then you're going to pre-digest it and you're not going to let your stomach do the work. And I was like, okay, I'll get the pan out and I'll throw it in the pan instead. But, you know, for me, I mean, a smoothie is beet and cauliflower and, you know, a bunch of other vegetables with a little bit of pea protein and some hemp milk. Tastes delicious, but you're right. It's pre-digested and it's not giving my mastication, my chewing, my enzyme production, right? So tell me a little bit more about this is totally sidetracking, but I want to go into sleep. How does all this affect our sleep? Oh yeah. Sleep is, is fundamental. I have, a, I actually had to write a chapter in my book, even though it's a keto and fasting book, I couldn't forget about sleep because you could do keto and fasting perfectly. But if your sleep is crap, you're just not going to allow the body to heal. Sleep is fundamental. It's the Swiss army knife of health. I call it. And it's the foundation because if, if, if you build that strong foundation with, with sleep, with, mastering your stress and your thoughts and your emotions with uh, movement that builds that, that base. So then when you have the supplements, when you have the nutrition that you're changing with keto or whatever it is and the fasting and the exercise, all that works much more efficiently. So sleep is important, especially if one of your goals is to have weight loss, which is a, it's a fine goal to have, but it's, you know, it's going to be a result of getting healthy and that you don't lose weight to get healthy. You get healthy to lose weight. Well, sleep is where a lot of the fat burning hormones are activated during Delta sleep stage four sleep. Not only that, I mean, this is your ballpark here. You got the brain that shrinks in size and you have the glymphatic system that is activated, flushing out toxins, your body's um, healing, your body is burning fat. And then you have REM sleep, which takes your short-term memory, processes it for long-term memory. So it helps with brain fog. It helps with mental clarity. It helps with remembering people's names. It helps with preventing Alzheimer's and dementia. So there was a study that I was looking, I was doing a video on sleep and I saw a few studies on uh, scientific American and, and it showed, you know, the participants who were getting less than five hours of sleep the following day, the next morning, they had higher levels of cortisol, the stress hormone, higher levels of glucose because glucose follows cortisol, higher levels of ghrelin, the hunger hormone and lower levels of leptin. So that means your willpower reserves are depleted. So you're going to make bad decisions that day. You're going to be hungrier because your ghrelin is up. And then when you do eat, you're going to be less satisfied because leptin is down, which is going to help you feel full. It's just a vicious circle. And then you probably are going to eat bad that day. You're going to be more stressed out. And then it's going to lead to another bad night of sleep. And it's just vicious circle. So we have to stop that right now and focus on some high quality sleep. And I could give some tips and tricks if you, if you'd like. Please do, because sleep, I can't agree more. I mean, if we don't sleep, we don't heal. And we can eat and do all the right things all day, but then it all falls apart at night when nothing's actually processing in the, in the house to, to make all that good information actually work. So what are your, your, because I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about so many things. I'm thinking about when people lose weight, they're detoxifying that fat and then their emotions come out with it because you said, mastering stress and emotions, which is also a huge thing, which contributes to people not sleeping. So mm -hmm. if, if they're there, so yes, what are some tips about sleeping? And then let, can we talk about mastering stress and emotions? Because that is a very significant, profound statement, mastering stress and emotions. Yeah, absolutely. We could get into that. So for sleep, it's important to have a routine where you go to the bed, you go to sleep at the same time, you wake up at the same time. That's going to help set your circadian rhythm. That's the way we were really designed to be. When you, when you think about our ancestors, again, the sun comes up, we're supposed to wake up shortly thereafter. The sun goes down, we're supposed to go to bed shortly thereafter. So I, I do believe it's much better for most people to go to bed earlier and wake up earlier versus going to bed later and waking up later because of um, there's a, something called money, money time sleep window, which is a really interesting phenomenon where and it depends on where you live in the world, how close you are to the equator. But uh, between the hours of 10 p.m. and 2 a.m., every hour of sleep within that window is equivalent to two hours of sleep outside of that window in regards to your delta deep sleep. And you could verify that by tracking it. I see it all the time with my sleep ring or a ring. And uh, you could get much more delta sleep by getting to bed during that time. So having some sort of nighttime routine, staying away from stimulation at night, whether it is the blue light that's coming through your TV screen or, or your lights, um, your cell phone, you go wear like a blue light blocking glasses. I'm wearing blue light blocking glasses right now. They're, these are not prescription. They're just filtering out for the day. And then I switch over to the ones that are orange at the nighttime. What that's going to do, it's going to filter out the junk light, 
It's going to help your body lower cortisol, which is what we want at night, and then allow melatonin to get increased. And they have an inverted relationship. So when you're not blocking out the light, you have cortisol activated, melatonin suppressed, and that's not good. We want the opposite. Uh, so some other things we can do, studies show the temperature is important. About 62 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit is the sweet spot where you're able to get a lot of good Delta sleep. So set the thermostat cold. If you live in Pennsylvania, it's not an issue. <laughs> uh, Crack the window yeah, open. Miami, I am in Philadelphia. And we were just discussing, it was 10 degrees when I woke up this morning and he's, Crazy. Like, he's not gonna visit me in South Carolina mm -hmm. until it's warm. And I was like, no, it's South Carolina. It was only 50 there last week. He was like, yeah, that's cold. <laughs> Like that's our that. coldest day yeah i have never even experienced 10 degrees in my life i don't i think the coldest temperature i've experienced was in boston that was like 27 degrees and i was just i couldn't even walk the streets oh well we have to do a little hot cold treatment then when we see each other and we'll take we you to the bath house because I, I i hear you but ice baths and cold showers mm -hmm. and that really that's another way to be flexible for your nervous system so we have some fun to yeah. have I agree. And my dog is snoring here. <laughs> he's like having, he's, he's dreaming and he's doing like a bubbling sound when he dreams. <laughs> um, yeah, that's actually, speaking of which cold, hot, that's actually good to do before bed an hour before bed, either take a cold shower or a hot shower. Uh, the cold shower will help you get ready for bed and even the hot shower too. And then a couple of other tips would be uh, banana tea. Have you ever heard of banana tea, Kelly? No, no. So banana tea, is a great little thing to try to give it a give it a shot. I don't like the word try. I'm going to replace that language to give it a shot. And you're going to use a banana with the peel on. You're going to keep the peel on, make sure it's organic, and you're going to boil the banana with the peel on. And the the peel has more micronutrients, potassium, magnesium than the actual banana itself. So you let it boil in, in water until the, the peel starts to turn brown. And then you just pour that tea, the water into a cup. You could put like a bag of chamomile tea or reishi mushroom if you want but you drink that and it helps calm you down. It's like nature's NyQuil. So having that for a lot of people, it works like a charm for some people. It doesn't do anything, but it's worth the shot. And then the final one more final tip would be to uh, going back to avoiding stimulation that includes watching the news. You know, watching the news is always a bad idea. First of all, if you're watching mainstream news, but at night, your subconscious mind is very impressionable. And if you're watching this fearful news, that's going to your subconscious mind. It's elevating your heart rate. And in order to fall asleep, you need a heart rate of 60 beats per minute or less. So that's not going to be conducive. Turn off the news, open up a book, have some sort of routine. And the more consistent you are with it, the more your body is going to get uh, in tune with this. And you're going to, you're going to notice, you know, 945, my body's ready to go to sleep. And for me, it's like clockwork. I, I, I rarely stay up past 12 a.m. unless I'm flying for some reason. There's only two nights that I stay up past 12 a.m. the entire year. Christmas Eve, because my girlfriend likes to stay up till 12 to do the present thing, and then New Year's Eve. And, I, and I'm miserable. I'm like, I'm not functioning well because my body is so used to going to bed at 9.45 and 10 o'clock. So I hope those tips helped. That's wonderful. And the other night I was with my son and I used the word, remember the, the term chill pill? Yeah, I do. I said to my son, take a chill pill. He goes, mom, I don't take drugs. What is that? <laughs> and it was interesting because I instantly went, it means take a deep breath, buddy. Just take a deep breath. This should be our new chill pill. Mm. Just take a breath, take five deep breaths because I think, you're right. You know, that, that 60 beats per minute. I mean, I do a lot of heart rate variability. You do the aura ring. And I'm sure that the majority of clients, when they take their heart rate, from looking at heart rate variability that I had for years, most people are well above the 60 beats per minute as a resting heart rate. Mm -hmm. And so a way to lower your heart rate is lower your breath rate, which is getting into more of a parasympathetic, which is accomplished by deep breathing. So that's another great addition to, but I'm trying the banana tea tonight. That's amazing. Oh, cool. I would imagine that adds potassium to your body somehow. And that yeah. help, helps relax the, okay. Correct. That's and then interesting. And then, yeah, the, the breathing thing is such an important point. Uh, a lot of people are, are mouth breathers. I'm, I'm one myself. So I'm, I'm getting more intentional with making sure I'm breathing through my nose. When I'm sleeping, I'm actually, I do, um, I do, I tape my mouth. Yeah. Perfect. So I, it forces me to breathe through the nostrils. Yeah. And, and just to bring that up, that's a great point because we talked about a lot about that with our airway podcast, because you create function through making your body breathe through your nose, which changes the anatomy. And this is an entrainment so that you won't have to do it long term. Just like ketosis, you entrain your body 
to do this. And then you can, like, I don't know as if I could change Ben at this point in his life and go, okay, you're going to eat a standard American diet. I don't think you have the ability to do that. Correct me if I'm wrong, like, because you feel so strong mm -hmm. and so healthy and so invincible, if you will, a little bit. I mean, mm -hmm. I know I feel a little invincible outside yeah. of, like, you know, a big sheet of metal coming at me <laughs> outside of that. I feel health wise. I feel stronger every year. Do you? Yeah, I love it. I do. I feel much healthier and stronger now than I did three years ago, right? I, I keep uncovering hidden stressors and removing it and my body keeps healing, just like to your point. And so the journey's never done. I think that's part of what I want people to understand from our message today is that Ben has been on this journey for a long time and he keeps upping the game and he keeps getting more optimization in his body and all the different lifestyle hacks nutritional hacks and the information that he's engaging in with his body to get his body to perform for him. And I'm still, and I'm still a work in progress. Like you said, I'm still identifying different, different areas of healing. I'm still doing detox. I'm still getting metals out of the body. I'm still throwing in different tools because it's, that's what it's about. It's, uh, and in the book, on my keto flex book, I talk about the three principles of healing in the first, uh, in the preface, I say, you know, this book is going to outline a lot of information. It's going to be a lot of details, a lot of studies, but there's only three principles to healing. Number one, identify interference. Number two, remove interference. And then number three, just allow your body to heal. It's exactly what you teach, Kelly, what I teach, what Dr. Pompa teaches. Those are the three main principles. And we're always seeking interference to remove. And for me, I'm still seeking interference myself. So it's a, it's a learning experience. And the goal is to keep doing it because the moment you stop, either you're creating or disintegrating. And I'd rather just keep creating and learning. I never want to stop and, until you know my meat suit is stopped, but then I, my, my soul is not stopped. It's going somewhere else. And yes, he's talking about his physical body versus soul is spiritual body. And so, Correct. but, and what you're saying is, is so important for people to get. And I really appreciate you saying that. And I think that when people go through this process, they, they get to a point where they want to give up. They, they get frustrated. They get, oh, I don't want to live this way anymore. You know, how did you overcome that? I mean, how did you manage your stress or master, as you said earlier, your stress and your emotions, because food is emotional. There's social pressures of eating the way we do. And, and let's be honest, well, the way we eat, the way we live, the way Pampa eats, it's difficult. Oh my God, never more stressed than when, when Mary Lee Dan came for the first time and I had taken to a restaurant. I was like, oh my God, we, we ended up in three different restaurants before we could finally sit down and eat at one. Like it's stressful to to try to go, oh my God, am I, I thought I was clean. And then Darren, Dan and Marilee made me feel like I was the dirty, ugly stepsister. It was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was, I didn't know about the oil. Holy cow. Yeah. You know? so can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I've been there with them before too, <laughs> finding <laughs> restaurants. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm somebody who was, who wanted to give up on life. I, I, I almost committed suicide several times and I so what stopped me during that time was thinking about my mother, of course, and how much I loved her and, and what I would do to her and the devastation she would have to endure. And that stopped me, but then I needed to figure things out. And uh, eating is an emotional event. Snacking is an emotional event. It, it's very emotional. So for me, what helped was finding my purpose, my highest value and values, plural, and then living on purpose with my purpose. So I've done a lot of work uh, with Dr. John D. Martini. He has a great book called The Values Factor, which helps you develop that. And, and your, your purpose and your values are unique to you. Nobody has them. So I've done a lot of work. And then I, I transferred a lot of the energy I was putting into suicidal thoughts, depression, addiction. I just, for me, it was a transference of energy. I just transferred that into my goals and what I wanted to achieve. My favorite definition for success is from Earl Nightingale. He said, success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And I had to unpack that a little bit because I was wondering, what is an ideal? And I, and I discovered that an ideal is an idea that you fall in love with. So that means you fall in love with the goal or goals. And then as long as, as, long as you're progressing towards that, as long as you're closing the gap between where you are today versus where you want to be, as long as that gap is getting smaller, you're successful. And that could be with your health. It could be with your finances. It could be with your relationship. It could be all that. 
So mm-hmm. it's the moment that you stop and you give up and you quit that you, ha- you are a failure. That's when you fail. Other than that, it's impossible to fail. So as long as you can close that gap. So for me, I'm always closing the gap and I'm setting my calendar based off of that. And I'm saying no to decision. It's a very easy decision. If I have an opportunity here or an opportunity there, if this opportunity doesn't align with my, my goals, my ideal, I say no. And if this does, I say, yeah, that's why I'm here with you today, Kelly, because conversations like this, it lights me up. I'm charged up when I speak to you. It's aligned with my highest value. So that's one way to really be empowered and to be the victor of your future, no longer the victim of your past. That is hugely powerful. And, and I feel that empathetically closing of the gaps. I, I'm constantly working on myself as well, because I know that that's what I do. That's what I like to do. It's my pastime, if you will, is how, because what I know is that if I have any resistance to anything, anybody, any food, anything in life, that's not me. Cause me is just my soul that it's my filter. And I need to get better at my filter because I don't want to have resistance to anything. I want, no matter what somebody puts in front of me, if they say it's delicious, I want to taste it. And I want to, I have no, I want to have no aversion to it. If it's, you know, I want you to go down this top highest, highest mountain and, and zip line down it. I want to have no hesitation to do it or dive to this deepest water on the scuba diving. I want to do it. I want to experience all of life. I have no resistance. That is my goal for me and for everybody else to experience life with lack of resistance, to just go with the flow, right? Yeah, that's beautiful. So with that though, I have recently become aware that I put a lot of pressure on myself and a lot of pace that I wasn't quite aware of particularly with this podcast, in all honesty, that I was putting the same pressure on my 40th podcast as I was my first five. And Mm -hmm. I've done this in every realm in my life. And that Nightingale, you said, right? Earl Earl Nightingale. Yeah. Earl Nightingale, success, success is the progressive realization of an ideal, which is beautiful. And closing the gap is really what you're saying, because I think that is better for people to understand. And that's what we're talking about nutrition keep closing the gap. You're never going to get there. Yeah. I mean, that's the point. You're never, because the second we figure it out, they're going to reintroduce some heritage food that none of us have ever heard about, like amaranth, or did you know that there's 57 types of avocados, avocados, for instance, like eat for earth. The gentleman that I was talking to you yeah. about Brandon Moorhead, he just did this whole thing. And honestly, it made me want to fall off my chair when it came for avocados, because he started talking about how all of our avocados are really from two companies that are both from Mexico that overspray and over use their land for avocado growth because they're feeding us Americans. So they're deforesting Mexico for our avocado use. And I literally have not looked at avocados the same in the last two weeks. And so now I'm like, Pocono Organics, which is another friend of mine, they've really instituted bringing in Food Forever, which is the program that's bringing food from heritage food from the food banks to reintroduce into our food system to expand our biodiversity of both our soil and our food culture. I love right. that. I'm, I'm going to look them up. I, I, I will hook you up with these people because you, you, you guys are all on the same alignment. And w- it was so interesting to me when I went to this Food Forever event, I was just blown away. I mean, I was eating zucchini flowers and was like, this is the best thing I've ever had in my life. How did I not know of this? Wow. Uh, flower grown off the zucchini plant. And there's just, what I'm saying is there's so much more food out there that we don't know about. Right that we, we have very limited. So even though we're eating the best diets right now that are available in the continental United States in the middle of COVID, we're doing the best we can. But in three years, I can guarantee you, we could have this podcast and talk about six new foods that have been introduced that nobody knew about all the nutritional benefits of it. 10 years ago, nobody knew what quinoa was. Right. <laughs> now it's a staple as the ancient grain. Right that you can buy at our local like 7-Eleven type store here. Totally, right. You know, and this food is changing. People are changing as our awareness changes. So close the gap, but don't get frustrated and, and keep working like Ben did through your stuff, allowing your body to heal all of the, whether it's the nutrition, the spiritual, the emotion, because they're all connected. Mm-hmm. All connected. And yeah, you're, you're so right. It's not about hitting the goal. It's about the person you need to become on your way towards that goal, the people you need to help, the relationships you create, 
that's what it's about. It's about the journey on your way to making that gap shorter and shorter and shorter. It's not necessarily about hitting the goal. So what lights, you know, what would light somebody up is to find something that's worth worthy and a worthy ideal, something that you love and don't let anybody dissuade you. Don't let, you know, there's a great book out there called the top five regrets of the dying, where there was a, a hospice nurse uh, in Australia and she would, she would survey patients that were dying on their deathbed, hundreds of them. And she would ask them, what is your biggest regret? What is your biggest regret? And she got their top five answers. The number one most common regret was not living a life true to themselves mm. and, and themselves instead living a life of what others expected of them. So others projected their highest values to them. And then they lived their life according to that, which they regretted. And that's something that I never want to regret. So it's important to find your purpose, live on purpose with your purpose, and don't let anybody stop you from pursuing that because that's your unique to you. God, the universe, mother nature gave that to you and nobody else, which is really special if you think about it. That's amazing. And I have nothing left to say on that, Ben. That was beautiful. And I, I pray that everybody listening, if this resonates with you, that you share this with your friends and family, this conversation went much deeper than a flexible ketosis diet. It's about being flexible with ourselves, getting to know ourselves and diving deep into who that is, because it is your gift. And you have a gift that we all want you to share with us, but who wants you to share it more than anybody is you, because that's what will make you healthy. And that'll make you focused and make all this other stuff, which is all it is, is just drama and allow you to focus on what's really important in your life, which is you. The rest of it's just the filter. Amen. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Ben. You know, Sound of Soul, which is standing here, I, we didn't really talk about it much when we talked the first time, I don't believe, but I just want to say that when we get together, I want to give you the gift of your own beautiful Sound of Soul on me because you have an amazing heart and your authenticity, I said it the first time and I'll say it again, is so rare and beautiful that I would be honored to give you a sound of soul so that the rest of us could, you could share that with whoever you wanted to. But for you to see the inner beauty that I feel from you every time I talk to you would be a great gift to be able to give to you because you give gifts to the world every day. Oh, I'm glad I brought this up. Ben has an entire academy. You do not have to end all your education here on this podcast. Go to the Keto Campers Academy, follow him, sign up for his classes, learn how your body works, learn how you can access your own tools so that you can master not only this physical body, and then you can start mastering your emotions and you can master your, your stress so that you're not, you're as strong as he is living and thriving in a world that most people are not thriving in, let's say right now. Kelly, thank you. Thank you for the beautiful words. I can't wait to go up there and hang out with you and do the sound of soul and uh, just hang out with you. I love your energy. I love what you're doing. It's just always a great conversation when we get together. It energizes me, which makes me know deep down in my soul that I, I want to have more time to spend with you and more time at your clinic. So when the summer rolls around, yeah. <laughs> I'll go up there with Natasha, my girlfriend. And, and we won't uh, tell them to put him in an ice bath to alternatively get <laughs> regulating. I'm, I'm for that. I'm, I'm for that. That's fine. It's different than living in, in, you know, the 20 degree yeah. weather. So it's temporary, right? Hey, so. Why I bought a second house in South Carolina, my Smart. friend. I totally got it. <laughs> now, this has been awesome. And thank you so much. Um, it's always, I'm always grateful to have the opportunity to share, especially with, with you. And you're just doing amazing work out there. So I just appreciate you so much. And thank you for today and just all the things that you're doing in this world. And thank you, Ben. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you for sharing this. This really, this was an amazing last few podcasts. I feel that we've really crossed a lot of bridges in regards to eating nutritionally, eating for the earth, working with the earth, working together, working with our bodies, and becoming flexible instead of rigid. And I pray that all of you enjoy great flexibility and enjoy great food tonight on your table. Pray over that food, love over that food, and know that it's giving you everything that you need. From our hearts to yours, we'll see you for the next beat here on The Beats. Mm -hmm.